Welcome to Hollywood Graveyard, where we set out to remember and celebrate the lives of those who lived to entertain us by visiting their final resting places. Today we're back in New York to find such stars as Gilbert Gottfried, Scott Joplin, Carl Sagan, Cicely Tyson, and many more. Join us, won't you? Welcome back to New York. We've covered a lot of ground here in previous videos, including our first New York series in 2019, and quite a few in our viewers' specials as well. So this isn't our first New York rodeo, but there's always more to discover here on the East Coast, with New York being one of the main art and entertainment hubs in America. So we're back again today to make our way through the cemeteries of the boroughs of New York City and beyond. If you haven't done so already, be sure to check out our previous videos from New York. Let's begin today in one of my favorite New York cemeteries, Historic Greenwood in Brooklyn. Here you're welcomed by one of the most stunning cemetery gateways in the world. Founded in 1838 as a rural cemetery, Greenwood was described as Brooklyn's first public park and was a popular haunting grounds for locals. It was so popular among tourists and visitors, it inspired the creation of Central Park. As the highest point in Brooklyn, this was also the site of the Battle of Long Island during the Revolutionary War. Greenwood is now a National Historic Landmark. And if you happen to wander down Sweet Gum Path here at Greenwood, you might run into one of the most unique cemetery animals we've yet encountered, this majestic raptor, who, to my relief, did not lunge at me and claw out my eyeballs, but rather showed off his impressive what is love dance skills. What is love? Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. No more. Let's kick off our tour by making our way to section 34. Here lies Paul Jabara. He was an actor and songwriter, an integral part of the disco movement in the 70s. He wrote the Donna Summer hit, Last Dance, for the 1978 film, Thank God It's Friday. The song won him the Oscar for Best Original Song. Last dance, last dance for love. He also had a hit with the Barbra Streisand Donna Summer duet, No More Tears, Enough is Enough. And another hit with the Weather Girls in It's Raining Men. As an actor, Paul appeared in the original cast of Hair on Broadway, and in the London production of Jesus Christ Superstar. And on film you saw him in Thank God It's Friday and The Lords of Flatbush. Paul was just 44 when he died from complications of AIDS. Heading west we arrive at Long Island's Cemetery Belt, a massive conglomeration of a dozen or more cemeteries spanning Brooklyn and Queens. As large as a city, it's visible from space and hosts an estimated 5 million dead, more than the living population of Queens. The first cemetery we'll visit here is Mount Carmel, a Jewish cemetery. Here rests a man who shares a name with the cemetery in which he's buried, Roger Carmel. The mustachioed character actor had numerous memorable turns on television in the 60s to the 80s. You Star Trek fans will remember him for his role as the flamboyant con artist Harry Mudd. I don't believe it. Welcome aboard, Kirk. Been a long time, eh? Harry Mudd. Well, to be absolutely accurate, Laddie Buck, you should refer to me as Mudd the First. He also played Roger in The Mothers-in-Law and made appearances in other shows like Hawaii Five-O and The Munsters. Later in his career, Roger lent his voice to animations, including as Cyclonus in the Transformers. He died from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy at the age of 54. Our next Mount Carmel stop brings us further south to the Von Tilzer family plot. This is Albert Von Tilzer. He was a Tin Pan Alley songwriter penning numerous popular hits in the early 1900s. His best-known song is one that many of you have sung at your local baseball stadium. In 1908, Albert co-wrote with Jack Norworth, Take Me Out to the Ball Game, regarded today as one of the greatest songs of the 20th century. Other popular songs include I'll Be With You in the Apple Blossom Time. Later, Albert contributed music to Broadway and film, 
including the musical Honey Girl. He lived to be 78. One row up is Albert's brother, Harry Von Tilzer. He too was one of the great songwriters of the Tin Pan Alley era. He got his start performing in circuses and on the vaudeville circuit, occasionally writing tunes as he did. But down on his luck and nearly broke, Harry penned what would be his first big hit, ironically, on the back of his overdue rent bill. The song was 1898's My Old New Hampshire Home, which would go on to sell over a million copies, becoming the big hit of its day. He followed this up with another smash hit, A Bird in a Gilded Cage, in 1900. His success led him to forming his own publishing company, which his brother Harry joined. And like his brother, Albert would also pen music for Broadway, including the Ziegfeld Follies. Both Albert and Harry were inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame. Several sections east, we find the grave of Betty Comden. She was a songwriter and screenwriter, whose musical comedy partnership with Adolph Green spanned six decades, and earned her numerous accolades in Hollywood musicals and Broadway shows. Their first Broadway hit was On the Town, writing the book and lyrics with music by Leonard Bernstein. It included the classic song, fitting for our tour today, New York, New York. Comden and Green soon found their way to Hollywood, writing for the movies, including the film adaptation of On the Town. Their biggest success came a few years later, writing the script for the popular classic Singin' in the Rain. Their next film, The Bandwagon, would earn them an Oscar nomination for Best Screenplay. They earned their second nomination for 1955's It's Always Fair Weather. Betty died from heart failure at age 89. In our original New York tour, we visited the legendary Edward G. Robinson here at Bethel Cemetery. We weren't able to get the best shot of his crypt here in the Goodman Mausoleum, so let's pay him a quick revisit today with a little better camera. Edward G. Robinson epitomized the tough guy gangster of Hollywood's golden age. He shot to stardom for his acclaimed performance as the sneering, psychotic Rico Bandello in 1931's Little Caesar. His performance set the standard for movie gangsters. Ernie? You're through. You hire these mugs, they miss. Now you're through. If you ain't out of town by tomorrow morning, you won't never leave it except in a pine box. I'm taking over this territory. From now on, it's mine. Other notable roles include Johnny Rocco in Key Largo, Barton Keyes in Double Indemnity, and Dathan in The Ten Commandments. Robinson also appeared in dozens of Broadway plays. He died from cancer just weeks after finishing Soylent Green, and just months before receiving an Honorary Academy Award in 1973. Honored for achieving greatness as a player, a patron of the arts, and a dedicated citizen. In sum, a renaissance man. His eulogy was delivered by Charlton Heston, and his pallbearers included George Burns and Frank Sinatra. Today, Edward G. Robinson ranks among the greatest male stars of classic cinema. Leaving the cemetery belt behind, we head northeast to Mount Hebron Cemetery. Here lies Jack Guilford. He was an actor of stage, film, and television who specialized in pantomime. Jack was nominated for several Tony Awards for supporting actor in shows like A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum and Cabaret. He would reprise his role in the film adaptation of A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, and in 1974 he'd be nominated for an Oscar for his role in Save the Tiger. Other memorable films include Cocoon. And on television he made appearances in shows like Soap, The Golden Girls, Night Court, and Taxi as Alex's father. Jack died from cancer at age 81. Doubling back west, we arrive at Mount Zion Cemetery in Queens. This is also a Jewish cemetery, and is perhaps the most densely packed cemetery I've ever been to. If New York City was a cemetery, this would be it. Standing in the middle, looking around in all directions, you're surrounded by a forest of headstones that disappear off into the horizon. Let's take a long stroll through this forest of headstones down path 28 to find the grave of Marvin Hamlish. He was a composer, one of only a handful to win the coveted EGOT, 
an Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, and Tony. Add a Pulitzer Prize on top of that, and he's one of the most awarded composers in American history. Marvin made notable musical contributions to both stage and screen productions. He was nominated for 12 Oscars, winning for the films The Sting, The Way We Were, and The Song of the Same Name. Memories of the way we were. Other notable film scores include The Spy Who Loved Me and A Chorus Line. He won a Tony and Pulitzer Prize for the Broadway production of A Chorus Line, which features the song What I Did for Love. Marvin Hamlish died from respiratory arrest at age 68. Stars like Barbara Streisand, Aretha Franklin, and Liza Minnelli sang at his memorial. Next up is Calvary, a Catholic cemetery. Here lies Patsy Kelly. Early on she had a successful stage career on Broadway before moving into motion pictures where she was known as the wisecracking sidekick of Thelma Todd in a series of short comedies in the 30s. And her notable feature films include There Goes My Heart and Nobody's Baby. Patsy Kelly was openly gay, highly unusual for that era when stars were generally forced to stay closeted or lose work. Her openness as a lesbian may have hindered her film career, which all but dried up in the 40s. But she found her second wind in television in the 50s, making guest appearances in shows like The Love Boat and The Wild Wild West. And her stage and film career resurged in the 60s and 70s, appearing in films like Rosemary's Baby and the 1971 Broadway revival of No No Nanette. Her wisecracking performance won her the Tony for Best Featured Actress in a Musical. Patsy died from cancer at age 71. Not far west is First Calvary Cemetery, with a view of the Manhattan skyline in the background. This is the grave of Joe Spinell. The Italian character actor was known for playing tough and shady characters. Early in his career he appeared as Willy Cicci in the Godfather films. And you fans of the Rocky films will remember him as the tough lone shark with a soft spot in his heart for Rocky, Tony Gazzo. So why don't you break his thumb like I told you to? When you don't do what I tell you to do, you make me look bad, right? I feel you, look. I figure if I break the guy's thumb, he gets laid off, right? He can't make the Yeah, well, don't money. figure it. Let me do the figure, it, okay, Rock? He's also remembered for his role in Taxi Driver. Later in his career, Joe found his niche as a leading man in B-horror films, several of which have become cult classics, including The Maniac and The Undertaker. Joe died suddenly in his queen's apartment at the age of 52, though there doesn't seem to be a firm consensus on his cause of death. Some sources cite a heart attack or list complications from asthma. Joe also suffered from hemophilia. According to other sources, he had reportedly cut himself deeply on glass in his shower, and instead of calling for help, tried to dress the wound himself and fell asleep, eventually bleeding out. Our last Long Island stop is St. Michael's Cemetery here in Queens. This is the final resting place of the king of ragtime, Scott Joplin. If you took piano lessons when you were a young kid like I did, odds are one of the pieces you learned was The Entertainer, one of Scott Joplin's most notable pieces. Scott Joplin began writing and publishing music in the 1890s. His first big hit was Maple Leaf Rag, which you're listening to right now, and was a nationwide smash. It was published in 1899 and would set the standard for ragtime music in the early 20th century. And although ragtime became associated with honky-tonk music in saloons, Joplin was actually heavily influenced by classical music, ballet, and opera. His passion later in life was to produce operas. His first opera was A Guest of Honor, which did not fare well and is considered lost. His second opera was Tremonitia, but Joplin was never able to get it staged in his life. By 1916 Joplin had developed syphilis. He was admitted to a sanitarium where he died at just 48. It wouldn't be until 1972 that Tree Manisha would have its full debut performance. It earned Scott Joplin a posthumous Pulitzer Prize for music. Joplin's death marked the end of the ragtime era as the music grew and morphed into what became jazz and swing. His music can be heard in countless film and television productions, including 1973's The Sting, which helped repopularize his music for a new generation.
Joplin's legacy was to revitalize American popular music and help foster appreciation for African American music among European Americans. He was portrayed by Billy Dee Williams in the 1977 biopic, Scott Joplin. Crossing East River we proceed north to the Bronx, and another of the storied cemeteries of New York City, Woodlawn. We found quite a few notable figures in our previous tour here, so be sure to check out our other video of Woodlawn for stars we've already covered here. Beginning in Catalpa section we find the grave of James Montgomery Flagg. He was an artist and illustrator known for his political comics and paintings. He created his most famous work in 1917 during World War I. It was a poster to encourage recruitment in the army during the war. It was the famous I Want You poster featuring Uncle Sam. The poster would be reissued during World War II. He produced other patriotic posters and paintings and illustrated books, but none had the enduring character of his Uncle Sam poster. James lived to be 82. Proceeding south, we reach Prospect Plot and the tomb of Harry Carey. No, not the baseball sportscaster, the film actor. He appeared in more than 200 productions in his career, starting out in the silent era as one of Western cinema's superstars. He transitioned well into the talkies, earning an Academy Award nomination for his role as President of the Senate in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Harry continued performing into the late 40s before passing away at age 69. Not far southeast, in the same section as Irving Berlin, we find the approximate location of the unmarked grave of songwriter Johnny Marks. Christmas is right around the corner, so it's a perfect time to visit Johnny Marks, who specialized in Christmas songs. Perhaps his best known work is Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, which he put to music based on the poem by his brother-in-law, Robert May. The song debuted in 1949, and has since become a Christmas standard. Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer had a very shiny nose. Other holiday classics he wrote include Rockin' Around the Christmas Tree, Rockin' Around the Christmas Tree at the Christmas Party Hop, A Holly Jolly Christmas, Have a Holly Jolly Christmas, It's the best time of the year, and Silver and Gold, Silver and Gold, Silver and Gold. In 1981, Marx was inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame. He died from complications of diabetes at age 75. In the small gentian plot in the Welts Mausoleum lies actress Louise Henry. She appeared in 21 films in the 1930s. Among them are End of the Trail alongside Jack Holt, The Murder Man alongside Spencer Tracy, and Reckless alongside Jean Harlow. She retired from film in the late 30s, but went on to open her own drama workshop in New York. She died from cancer at age 55. Up the hill to one of the newer developments in the cemetery, we find the niche of actress Diane Carroll. She rose to prominence appearing in some of the early studio films featuring black casts like Carmen Jones and Porgy and Bess. In 1962, she won a Tony for her role in the Broadway musical No Strings, a first for an African-American woman. She was also nominated for an Academy and Award Diane for her role in Claudine. in Claudine. And on television, she's remembered for her role as Dominique in Dynasty, and her starring role in the 60s and 70s sitcom Julia, which is notable for being the first weekly series to star a black woman in a non-stereotypical role. Diane passed away from cancer at age 84. Let's head back now to Jazz Corner, where numerous jazz legends are laid to rest, including Miles Davis, who we visited previously. Award-winning actress Cicely Tyson was married to Miles Davis, and after her death in 2021, was reportedly laid to rest here with her husband. However, to date there is no marker for her. Cicely Tyson was an actress known for playing strong African-American women. Her career began on the New York stage in productions like The Blacks and Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright. Her breakout film role was as Rebecca in the 1972 film Sounder. Her performance earned her an Academy Award nomination for Best Actress. And on television, her portrayal of the title character in The Autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman won her two Emmy Awards. 
Other notable films include The Help and Fried Green Tomatoes, and she would return to the stage to win a Tony for the play The Trip to Bountiful. Her final performances on screen include a recurring role as Ophelia in How to Get Away with Murder. In 2019, Cicely was awarded an Honorary Academy Award. She passed away in 2021 at the age of 96. Crossing the street west, let's head up the hill to find the distinctive grave of Jackie McLean. You may have deduced from his marker that Jackie was a jazz saxophonist. He began performing and recording in the 40s and 50s, including with Miles Davis. By the 60s he began releasing his own albums of music, many of which are considered jazz classics. He also composed music, including for the play The Connection. He dedicated his later life to teaching, including founding the University of Hartford's African American Music Department, now named in his honor. Jackie died at age 74, and that same year was elected into the Downbeat Hall of Fame. A short walk west brings us to Norma Miller, known as the Queen of Swing. She was a professional Lindy Hop dancer who performed on stage and in film and television. She toured the world in the 30s and 40s, dancing with headliners like Ethel Waters, performing for the troops overseas, even doing her own comedy routines. She made appearances in shows like Sanford and Son and in films like Malcolm X. Norma was also a dance choreographer, earning an Emmy nomination for her choreography of Stompin' at the Savoy. On top of all this, Norma was also an accomplished songwriter. She lived to be 99. Back east a little ways is the grave of actress Clarice Taylor. You fans of The Cosby Show will remember her as Anna Huxtable, the mother of Cliff Huxtable. The role earned her an Emmy nomination. She's also remembered for playing Cousin Emma on Sanford and Son. On stage, Clarice played the Good Witch of the North in The Wiz, and on film she was Birdie in Play Misty for Me. Clarice died from heart failure at age 93. We've arrived now at Sassafras section. Herein we find the grave of Nora Bays. She was a singer and vaudeville performer popular in the early 1900s. She is credited with co-writing the song Shine On Harvest Moon. Nora is perhaps best remembered today for introducing the George M. Cohen song Over There, a World War I patriotic song meant to galvanize the American troops. The music is featured right here on Nora's Stone. Over there. Nora performed on stages across Europe and America, including in early Ziegfeld Follies. By 1910 she began making the first of her more than 160 recordings of popular songs. She continued to perform until illness slowed her down. It was stomach cancer. She died after an operation for the illness at just 47. After her death her husband refused to bury her until his own death, so she was housed in a receiving vault for some 18 years. After his death, they were both laid to rest here in unmarked graves. It wasn't until 2018 that fans and Nora's granddaughter arranged for this marker to be placed. A fictionalized biopic was made about her life, titled Shine On Harvest Moon. Northwest, in Whitewood Plot, is the mausoleum of Victor Herbert. He was a popular composer of the early 20th century, known particularly for his operettas. His best known work is 1930's Babes in Toyland, which weaved together various characters from Mother Goose nursery rhymes. I'd wager you're familiar with the pieces Toyland, and March of the Toys. Babes in Toyland has been adapted on screen a number of times, including by Laurel and Hardy in 1934 and by Disney in 1961. Other notable works include the operetta Naughty Marietta, which gave us the song Ah Sweet Mystery of Life. He also wrote incidental music for plays and numerous orchestral compositions. Victor died suddenly from a heart attack at age 65. Not far in from the main entrance is this distinctive Egyptian-inspired mausoleum, belonging to Frank Winfield Woolworth. 
he was a businessman, the founder of the F.W. Woolworth Company, which operated a chain of convenience stores across the United States known as Five and Dimes, offering low-priced merchandise. During his life there were around a thousand Woolworth stores across the country, and Woolworth owned what was the tallest skyscraper in Manhattan at the time. The chain continued to expand globally. Woolworth died in 1919 at age 66. Also entombed herein is Woolworth's granddaughter, socialite Barbara Hutton. She was known as the Poor Little Rich Girl. As heiress to the Woolworth fortune, she was one of the wealthiest women in the world, and therefore one of the most famous. Her tumultuous private life was the stuff of tabloid fodder, including seven marriages, one of which was to screen legend Cary Grant. She was also generous with her wealth, supporting numerous philanthropic causes. She died from a heart attack at age 66. East of here is one for you circus lovers. This is the tomb of James Bailey. He's the Bailey in Barnum and Bailey Circus. He ran away from home at a young age after the deaths of his parents, eventually finding work in a circus. By the time he was 22, he was manager of his own circus, Cooper and Bailey Circus. A year later he joined with Phineas T. Barnum to form Barnum and Bailey Circus, which they built into the greatest show on earth. Barnum was the face of the circus while Bailey worked his magic behind the curtain, becoming renowned for his managerial and logistical skills. Even the US military copied Bailey's organizational tactics for transporting people, animals, and equipment. Bailey also managed Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. James Bailey died in 1906 at age 58, after which Barnum and Bailey became part of Ringling Brothers. He was inducted into the International Circus Hall of Fame in 1960. Around the corner across the street is the grave of Geraldine Fitzgerald. She was an Irish-American actress who appeared in close to 100 productions from the 30s to the 90s. Her role as Isabella in 1939's Wuthering Heights earned her an Oscar nomination for Best Supporting Actress. Other films include Dark Victory and Arthur. On the Broadway stage, she made her American debut alongside Orson Welles in Heartbreak House, and in 1971 earned acclaim for her performance in Long Day's Journey into the Night. She even found success as a theater director, becoming one of the first women to receive a Tony nomination for Best Direction of a Play for Mass Appeal. And on television she made numerous notable appearances including an Emmy-nominated performance on The Golden Girls. Geraldine battled Alzheimer's later in life, passing away at age 91. Heading west, we off-roaded a bit to find the McManus Mausoleum. George McManus was a cartoonist, best remembered as the creator of the long-running syndicated comic strip Bringing Up Father, featuring the characters Jiggs and Maggie. It ran for 87 years, from 1913 to 2000. Bringing Up Father would be adapted as an animated series in the silent era, in the very early days of animation. Two real live-action comedies would follow, and even feature films. McManus continued to produce the comic strip right up until his death in 1954. This is Clover Plot, where we find the grave of Bud Fisher, another cartoonist. In 1907 he created what is generally regarded as the first successful daily comic strip in the United States, Mutt and Jeff. It remained in syndication until 1983. In 1911, Esther Studios in New Jersey acquired the rights to make short films based on Mutt and Jeff, but Bud soon took on producing Mutt and Jeff short comedies himself. Throughout the silent era, hundreds of Mutt and Jeff shorts were produced. Bud Fisher died from cancer at age 69. Our last Woodlawn stop brings us to the community mausoleums near the chapel. Here is the niche of Barbara Britton. She was an actress of film and television, remembered for numerous western roles alongside the likes of Randolph Scott and Gene Autry, like Loaded Pistols, and war dramas like So Proudly We Hail, as well as rom-coms like The Fabulous Suzanne. She also had a starring role on radio and television as amateur sleuth Pam North in Mr. and Mrs. North. She also played Laura Petrie in Head of the Family, the pilot for The Dick Van Dyke Show, the role which would go to Mary Tyler Moore in the series. Barbara died from cancer at age 59.
Heading out of New York City, we proceed north now to Westchester County and Kensico Cemetery. Another one we've previously visited, but we're back to unearth more stories in these grounds. Our first stop here brings us to Section 71 and the grave of Dorothy Loudon. The actress and singer won the Tony Award and the Drama Desk Award for her role as Miss Hannigan in the original Broadway production of Annie. Other notable stage performances include Ballroom, which earned her another Tony Award nomination, and Sweeney Todd. While principally known as a stage actress, she did perform on television as well, including more than 30 appearances on Gary Moore's variety show, as well as a guest role on Murder, She Wrote. And her film roles include Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. Dorothy died from cancer at age 78. Next up here at Kensico, we find the grave of Al Hirschfeld. He was an artist and caricaturist, known particularly for his black and white line drawing caricatures of stars from Broadway, film, and television. Al had an incredible knack for being able to capture the likeness and personality of stars with only a few simple black ink lines. Drawing for around nine decades, Al Hirschfeld captured just about every major personality of the 20th century, including Frank Sinatra, Ringo Starr, Clint Eastwood, Barbara Streisand, Sammy Davis Jr., Bob Hope, Marilyn Monroe, George Burns, Liza Minnelli, Jim Henson, Greta Garbo, The Marx Brothers, Cher, Whoopi Goldberg, Carol Channing, Steven Spielberg, Judy Garland, Abbott and Costello, Laurel and Hardy, Buster Keaton, Katherine Hepburn, Leonard Nimoy, Alfred Hitchcock, Humphrey Bogart, Jack Lemmon, Meryl Streep, Aerosmith, the cast of Seinfeld, and many, many more, including himself. Adorning his tombstone is his caricature self-portrait, drawn in his own inimitable way. A documentary was made about him called The Line King, The Al Hirschfeld Story. It was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature. Hirschfeld also famously hid the name of his daughter Nina in every drawing made after her birth in 1945. His work is currently exhibited in a number of institutions, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Al lived to be 99. In our previous tour here, you'll recall our visit to the Actors Fund plot. Contrary to common perception, most actors and entertainers aren't super wealthy. Only the very top tier are. And back in the day, there was no such thing as residuals and royalties. So many stars fell on hard financial times later in life after their careers dried up. So to help out these beloved entertainers in their latter years, Funds have been created. The Actors Fund of America helps cover funeral expenses for actors of stage and screen, many of which are laid to rest in this plot. Let's meet a few more folks here. Florence Reed began performing on stage in the early 1900s, playing roles like Dulcinea in Don Quixote and Ophelia in Hamlet. She'd become one of the grand dames of the Broadway theater in plays like The Shanghai Gesture and The Yellow Ticket. Florence began appearing in films during the silent era, around 1915. Her best-known film role was her first talkie, playing Miss Havisham in Great Expectations. She rounded out her career making appearances in very early television. Florence lived to be 84. Florence's neighbor here is Blanche Yurka, who was also her friend when they were alive. Blanche was an opera singer and actress. She had minor roles at the Metropolitan Opera before making her Broadway debut in 1907. Among her notable roles was as Queen Gertrude in Hamlet. She also earned high praise for her roles in the various plays of Ibsen. As a renowned stage actress, Blanche looked down on film as a lesser art, and avoided it until her late 40s, finally appearing in her first feature film in 1935's A Tale of Two Cities, considered by many as her greatest film role. Other films include The Song of Bernadette and Cry of the Werewolf. Like her friend Florence, she too rounded out her career making appearances on early television, including craft theater. She lived to be 87. A few rows away is Vivian Blaine. She's best remembered for originating the role of Miss Adelaide in the stage production of Guys and Dolls, and reprising her role in the subsequent film version in 1955. In other words, just from wondering whether the wedding is on a roof, a person <laughs> can develop a core. She also shared top billing with Laurel and Hardy in Jitterbugs and played the title character in Dollface. 
On television she played Betty on Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, and made guest appearances on shows like Fantasy Island and Murder, She Wrote. Vivian died from heart failure in 1995. Heading to the other side of the plot we find Gloria Foster. She began performing in off-Broadway plays, including her Obie award-winning performance in the play In White America. Other plays include A Raisin in the Sun, Cherry Orchard, and Mother Courage. She soon took her talents to the screen, appearing on shows like Mod Squad. But audiences today remember her best as the Oracle in the Matrix films. You're in control of your own life. Remember? Here. Take a cookie. Her final film, The Matrix Reloaded, was released after her death from diabetes at age 67. Across the street north is Sharon Gardens, a Jewish cemetery. Here we find a beloved comedian with a very distinctive voice, Gilbert Gottfried. Gilbert launched his career doing stand-up comedy around New York, and was even a cast member on SNL for a season. As he continued to perform on stage and television, he developed his trademark exaggerated shrill voice, which would lead to a successful career as a voiceover artist. Perhaps his best known voice role is that of Iago, the loud-mouthed parrot, in the Aladdin series on film, TV, and even video games. We're never gonna get a hold of that stupid lamp! Just forget it! Gilbert was also nominated for an Emmy for his voice work for the cartoon Cyber Chase, and even lent that inimitable voice to a duck for the Aflac commercials. In front of the camera, Gilbert had memorable roles in films like Beverly Hills Cop 2 and the Problem Child films. Gilbert was also known for his comedy roasts, his raunchy routines standing in stark contrast to his family-friendly cartoon work. Gilbert died from a heart condition at the age of 67. His epitaph, Too Soon, has dual meaning here. He left us too soon, but it also refers to his penchant for telling jokes about sensitive current issues and events, in response to which audiences would call out, too soon. New York isn't just the city and surrounding areas. New York the state is a big place, and there are famous graves all over it. Like Lucille Ball way out west in Jamestown, who we featured in our viewers special, and Rod Serling in the Finger Lakes area, who we featured in our Twilight Zone special. Let's wrap up our time today by hitting the scenic roads outside of the big city to find a few more famous graves. Ah, the simple pleasures of visiting New York cemeteries in autumn, when the air is cool and crisp, the sun low on the horizon shining through the leaves of the trees as they change color and fall to the ground. I won't lie, I was tempted to jump into this pile of leaves. Or maybe I did, but there's no video evidence one way or the other. This is the city of Auburn and Fort Hill Cemetery. Here in these beautiful grounds we find one of the great social reformers in American history, Harriet Tubman. She was born into slavery in the early 1800s, suffering greatly as a child under the hands of her enslavers. In 1849 Harriet escaped north to Pennsylvania by way of the Underground Railroad, an informal network of routes and resources to help enslaved people escape to freedom. In the years that followed, she would return south numerous times to help her family members and friends escape to freedom through the Underground Railroad. By the outbreak of the Civil War, Harriet had succeeded in rescuing some 70 slaves. In all her expeditions, she never once was caught or lost a passenger. She became known as the Moses of her people. During the Civil War, she worked for the Union Army as a cook and nurse, then as a scout and spy, helping to liberate even more enslaved people. She continued to be active in social causes, including women's suffrage, until she passed away around the age of 90. Since her death, Harriet Tubman has been commemorated in art, literature, music, on film, on stamps, in parks, and efforts are currently underway to have Harriet replace Andrew Jackson on the $20 bill. All reminders of a strong woman who has become a symbol of courage and freedom in the face of unspeakable horrors and inhumanity. Her gravestone was erected by the Empire State Federation of Women's Clubs in 1937. And finally, we turn the compass south to Ithaca, New York, and Lakeview Cemetery. 
Here lies a man who helped us all understand our place in the universe and our connection to it, Carl Sagan. In the 1980s, Carl Sagan helped instill in a young Arthur a curious and inquisitive mind. Perhaps he did so for you as well in his science program, Cosmos. Carl Sagan was an astronomer, author, and educator. He became the world's greatest popularizer of science in the television era, making it more accessible to the general public. In 1980, he debuted the 13-part television series, Cosmos, A Personal Voyage, which he hosted and co-wrote with his wife, Andrianne. It was PBS's most popular series for an entire decade. The series won two Emmys and a Peabody Award, and has been seen by over 500 million people in some 60 countries. It became a watershed moment for science-themed television programming, and perhaps inspired some of your favorite science channels right here on YouTube. Sequels to Cosmos have been produced in recent years. Carl wrote and published many books as well, one of his stories even being the basis for the 1997 film Contact, which was dedicated to his memory. Carl also had an intense interest in the search for extraterrestrial life. In 1977, he assembled the first physical messages sent into outer space on spacecraft, the Voyager Golden Records, which contains sounds and images from Earth, including music and voice messages. This was created as a greeting from Earth should any advanced civilization ever find it. Carl compared it to throwing a message in a bottle into the cosmic ocean. Carl Sagan died from pneumonia after battling cancer for two years. He was 62. We spent a lot of time on this channel talking about the lives and deaths of stars, but Carl Sagan taught us about the lives and deaths of stars in an entirely different way. He reminded us that we are, each of us, made of star stuff. The very elements in our bodies, the iron in our blood, the calcium in our bones, were forged in the fiery hearts of distant stars. The lives and deaths of the stars seem impossibly remote from human experience, and yet we're related in the most intimate way to their life cycles. Because the cosmos is also within us, we're made of star stuff. We are a way for the cosmos to know itself. So famous or not, me and you, we are all, each and every one of us, stars. Remember that next time you look up at the Milky Way, or feel the warmth of the sun on your face on a clear autumn afternoon. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one. Just a couple of Los Angeles dudes hanging out in New York, filming graves. Good times with this guy. Oh, I got some bad stuff.